Welcome to Senate Education on Thursday, February 15th. We are starting with uh, continuing our conversation on S220 from yesterday. This is uh, an act relating to Vermont Public Libraries. And if everyone has their, hopefully say maybe their sheet from yesterday, we left off, uh, we're going to move to Section 7. So again, I think the two things that we need to, uh, the one thing we need to return to now is section six. We'll have a conversation about it at some point again, where the whole committee is uh, on um, patron records and age. So I apologize also, I lost my glasses, so I'm using Senator Westman's. <laughs> oh, I see, I think I see. <laughs> um, so please, uh, could we pick up with then the library consultant position? Yes. This is seven. So this is section seven. It runs from pages nine to ten. This section establishes three full-time library consultant positions, uh, one within the Agency of Education, two within the Department of Libraries. And there's an appropriation at the end of the bill associated with these three positions. Did they mention at the end of the bill how much? Do you remember when we walked through it? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yes, 225000 to the Department of Libraries for the two positions, and half of that, 112500 to the Agency of Education. So for three full-time library consultant provisions, one would be two Department of Libraries. Wow, that's a lot. I'll be surprised if that makes it over the finish line, Ms. Delneo. Just honestly, and I think this committee just needs to prioritize is this where we would, if, if appropriation says, hey, we have $500,000 to spend on positions, is this where you would want to put them, or would you want to put them somewhere else, perhaps with the agencies? Please, yeah, Senator Dillon. Are there any library consultants now? Yes, we have youth services, access services, uh, technology, uh, government information and reference, continuing education and operations. I feel like I'm skipping one because they're not watching. We have six, six, six or seven, six or seven. Okay. Yes, okay. and this is not a request from the department. It's sure. Really it's from the report. It. Yeah. Ms. Delneo, would you just? What is it when you say consult? When this says consultant, they're talking about part time kind of consultant, or is this a term that is used? This is, um, it's this is a civil service position full time, and they are uh, most of the consultants have a master's degree in library science and they consult on those specific topics that I just mentioned. Um, they serve as experts who um, help to train people in the certificate program, so they teach core courses. They also consult library directors and they consult library trustees. So our department does a lot of work to support libraries throughout the state kind of being their best selves. And so that is how that term is used and the pay that's associated with it is for that full-time um, degree professional with a master's in library science. And recognizing that this isn't coming from the Department of Libraries, but from the study committee, would you mind weighing in on this as to the need? Um, the, the recommendation of the working group didn't actually specify additional positions for the department. The working group recommended that um, if there was additive work for the department, then it would be important not to add the additive work to the existing group. So just to clarify it, the working group's position didn't call out two positions or these specific positions. Uh, as far as the department's need, the need for support for libraries is great. However, um, the department recognizes that there are many competing priorities at this time, and we did not include a specific request to grow our team in this budget. And I think that's really, um, as far as our priorities, we are focused on using the resources that we have to serve the community in the best way that we can. And we're not uh, prioritizing these specific positions. And I think some of what my testimony shared was really showing areas where we might be able to 
change our approach and lessen the impacts on the department. And we'll, that will come up later as you go through the, the bill today. Yeah, please. I think I can speak for the one that would be housed in the Agency of Education, which is coming from the school. You know, that was, I'm sorry, I was thinking so much about the department. Yeah, that's The all, working yeah. group did recommend, um, the working group, and this is not the department, I just want to make sure you see the chat I'm wearing at this time. The working group report did um, reflect what the school librarians shared with the community, which is that they would like to see a position restored to AOE that was removed maybe 20 years ago. Uh, and that that is a that is a like a school library consultant position. So thank you, uh, Senator, for I mean for reminding me of that. Yeah, it would be Senator. But that's I, I do just have to put a point there. That's not an AOE or a Department of Libraries recommendation. Right. That's coming from school libraries. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else on this section? I'll mark it that we need to have a conversation about consultant positions and the part of the uh, Senate creating one position within the agency. But anything else right now? On it? Yeah. I like that we're talking about hiring somebody within the agency. That's right. And not farming it out to a non profit or consulting group or so, yeah. But oh, right now, I get the word yeah. I'm not sure where we're going to find the money, right? Right, and I think this committee, I'm sure, appropriations again would ask us is this as big a priority as maybe getting somebody on the ground to make sure laws are being enforced and kids are reading and. Oh, that's George said. Hasn't been on the books for 20 years, and we can hear from folks as to whether or not that was making a difference or not. Okay. Section eight. Good for section eight. All right. This is on page 10. This and one is fairly straight down. Forward. Just a little bit. I don't know. When I, just to put it, I'm going to put a 32 instead of 35. People we'll get called on the amount. I instantly felt the change. So, no, uh, <laughs> first. Uh, all right. That's right. You're from the South. I'm just the start of the South. <laughs> South on Massachusetts. Massachusetts. <laughs> uh, <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So on page 10, this is relating to training and education for library staff. And really what this is doing is codifying an existing practice of the department. Um, so this section proposes to amend the department's duties to formalize the practice of providing continuing education for a certificate and published librarianship. And again, this is already a certificate program that exists within the department. They have a curriculum for librarians to get this certificate. This is putting it in the duties of the department. Affirmative. Okay. Okay. All right. Sections nine and 10, public safety. So there are two provisions within Title 13 that are amended in these sections. Section 9 amends 13 BSA section 1702 to add public libraries to the provisions governing criminal threatening at certain public facilities and locations. So, for example, government buildings, polling places during elections, uh, school buildings, and here public libraries are added in as well. Questions? So, this is, uh, you're talking right now just. 13 BSA 1702, right? Yes. So this is adding public libraries provisions governing criminal threatening. So right now it's schools, government field, some government buildings, public or private schools, post secondary, places of worship, polling places during election activities, state house, or any federal, state, or municipal building. Now, municipal buildings already cover a big chunk of what the public libraries are. But there are public, free public libraries that are available to the public or places of public accommodation, but would qualify as a municipal building if would be covered by this was I'm bringing up grouping them in. What do folks think? Sounds good to me. Yeah. 
It's already covered in statute, right? Well, not all of them. A, a lot of libraries are. We, I don't know the percentage, but those that are like your colleges, your post-secondary institutions, your school libraries are covered. Uh, any that are municipal buildings, which would be any of your municipally established libraries, but the association libraries, incorporated libraries that are through public libraries would be brought in with this language. I like my my hometown library, Rebecca Cooks said that it's she was concerned. She was concerned about it because we don't have a town police department. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna make her library staff enforces it. And she doesn't want to be in that business. Wow, that is a municipal building. So that's it's already that's it's a municipal a, building, right. then it already she's already in that yeah. position. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is, I think, just pulling in <laughs> some extra, some of uh, some orphan libraries, if you will, right. that aren't there. Okay. Senator Weeks thoughts? Uh, no. Okay, seems reasonable. Interaction. Uh no. Nope. Okay. Since so we're okay with that. And so now for uh VSA four zero zero four. Yes, so section ten and man's thirteen VSA section four thousand four uh, to add public libraries to the statute that governs the possession of dangerous or deadly weapons in a school bus, school building, or school property. This includes if you go on firearm possession, um, public libraries and library grounds are added into the prohibitions here in section 4004. So this is outside of the building. So we're talking about now grounds, things like that. It would be in the public library or on the public library's property. Center sheet. And so well, just to be candid, this particular part was uh, was an idea that came from a constituent of mine a year ago. Mm -hmm. And the one of the things that I learned and thinking about and I'm looking at this is you know, it's it's my understanding there's different categories of public areas. And you have designated, you have a limited form, so like courthouses, for example, which only certain people can come in and out, but they're or, you know, like military bases are public, only certain people can come in and out. Courthouses, also public, can't carry a firearm into either of those. But with a public library, where my understanding, there's no, you, know, you, you can't tell somebody that they can't come in. Is there a potential issue in saying, for this public forum, you can't bring a firearm in? Do you see any issues there? I will only say that it is something the community should investigate and get some expert testimony on, especially with updates to Second Amendment jurisprudence. Yeah. This could be considered, I don't know if Eric Fitzpatrick discovered this in your committee yet, mm -hmm. but it is sensitive location. Yeah. Okay. That's a lot of discussion. I don't know. I do not have the depth of knowledge to give you a, a deep answer. Okay. In a week. Does, does, is it, thanks, sir. Does it have the intention of exception of law enforcement officers, et cetera, et cetera? I, I don't see that reference. I will have to go back through the full text of the statute to see if there's already a carve out for law enforcement officers. I know that in many of the statutes, including, for example, the hospital buildings statute that passed exactly. recently, there's a carve out for law enforcement and security personnel. There is a carve out here. In, Subdivision C3 for possession of firearms if the trustees of the library authorize possession or use for specific occasions or other specific it's little, purposes. It's, it's it is slightly different. Please, Senator Williams. So, school bus, if the school district owns the bus, that's considered school property. Um, again, we have testimony from Rebecca Cook, that she didn't think that she wanted to get into that. Um, and basically, we make it a, a, a sensitive area. And I don't support Section 10. Now, didn't we have uh, Chris Bradley, the Federation, who yeah. testify on this? Yeah, he asked me, call guy? Yep. Yeah. Uh, he's following proceedings. 
we're going to, uh, okay. he texted that he'd like to come in if we move forward with that in peace. And I'm going to ask Morgan to have Eric Fitzpatrick in. Okay. He's going to follow Morgan. Oh, okay. yes. oh, sorry. Sorry. Next week to comment on that. Piece I mean, there's, the they could do the same thing by putting a sign up there that says, um, no firearms, no deadly weapons. And then if they violate it, they're in violation of the trespass. So do we have to make, and you know, do we have to make the libraries a soft target where people know that that's a, that's a place where nobody's going to be carrying a fire or a gun to run? And that's typically what happens. Yeah, I, I just think uh, to your point, even if even if sign is put up, and you know, we can learn more from Eric, but even if a sign is put up and the library is still considered a public place that's open to everybody, there could still be a issue when it comes to prohibiting carrying firearms. Uh, you know, the, the other analogy is, you know, carrying a firearm in a public park. You, you can't do that. Right? Uh, you know, there's no limits to who can go in and out of a public park. Uh, and so I'm wondering if or how that same concept would apply to a public library if there's no limits on who can come in and out. So those are, those are my you thoughts. Been through that in your other yeah. yeah, so those are some of my initial thoughts on it. Yeah, but I think Eric, yeah, Eric gave those for us. Okay, I swiped it, please. All right. Uh, I did want to go back to Senator Reed's question. Yes, in subsection C of the section, there is an exemption for law enforcement officers engaged in their duties. It's not in the bill because it's not being changed. Oh, okay. But in the, yes, in those ellipses, there's. So not applied to. All right. Sections 11 through 14. It's a series of uh, amendments to the library governance sections in Title 22. Um, and these sections amend provisions governing the mandatory and discretionary duties within the general law governing public libraries to align those duties to powers with the statute governing the powers and duties of library trustees. So sections 11 and 13 reflect each other so that there's consistency in those statutes with what the duties and authority of those officers are. Second, it amends provisions governing the maintenance of appropriations for public libraries by municipalities to provide that a municipality shall vote to appropriate funds for its public libraries in sufficient amounts for the maintenance, care, and increase of libraries. So you'll see that in section 13. It's the primary operative language. That second sentence has changed to say that the annual, at the annual municipal meeting, the municipality shall vote to appropriate money in sufficient amounts. <laughs> it's not a significant departure from the underlying law, but it is a substantive shift in how that duty is phrased. Can I do it? I'm, I'm not well schooled in legal language. Um, what is the legal definition here of the corporation? In Which section? Page 13, page 5. Yes. So section 105 is going to apply to the trustee incorporated libraries. So we'd we'll be speaking specifically to the library, the public okay. library itself. Okay. So we ran into this when I was on town select board, the library, because it's a municipal library, it came. They wanted to give their all their employees a raise, but it was going to be a substantial increase to the budget. And because they have a board of trustees, we said, well, I'll keep a percentage of the increase and we'll give it to the trustees and allow them to decide who gets lost for, for a raise. That was one way around it. But it was also some, some loophole in there with the board of trustees that. Um, could have caused problems for the municipality because the way we did it. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I can't remember. I'll have to find out more about it. But it had something to do with it had to do with the fact that we had a board of trustees. Right. Okay. 
uh, certainly see a problem with insufficient amount. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just a landmark. Where, where are you right uh, now? At page 14, this, line 18. Yeah. You know, insufficient amount. I mean, there's never enough money for anybody for anything, for any good purpose. What do you think Scroll. of that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that clause is added so that the municipality isn't just a contributor to the maintenance and care of the library. They are the base contributor. The appropriations from the municipality have to be in any level amount to actually support the maintenance and care of the public library. Yeah, but that's already the case, right? They are the source. Yes. Yep. You no. Know, not necessarily. Not everyone. Please. Please. Um, so I want to just, I have a question first and then I can answer. But and I'm sorry, I interrupted the ledge council. Did you want to say something first? No. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I want to just clarify this section applies just to municipal public libraries. So the, the level of funding for municipalities to public libraries is varied and even libraries that are municipal public libraries may not be receiving all of their funding from the municipality. Good. And they, the working group heard repeatedly that the funding was insufficient. So then we looked at the, the that the annual appropriations were very challenging to operate within, I think is a good way to put it. And um, in the working group's report, we broke down both municipal and incorporated public libraries. So those are the 30% that are nonprofits. Um, but for both of them, the the state of Vermont was considerably far from the average per capita spending for libraries of the same size. So looking at five libraries that serve 5,000 people, libraries that serve 1,000 people. So funding for the libraries, both municipal and incorporated is, um, an area of continual concern and is often not sufficient to provide the service that statute says every Vermont is to make a description. Yeah, I guess it seems to me that we'd be creating a, maybe I'm missing something, a real mess around uh, with select boards and other city councils where there are you know, competing demands. And in statute, it says the libraries, there could be a major flood, but then people are going to say, well, but the, you know, I, I just worry about precedent. I've never seen us put anything that says sufficiently without some kind of definition of center reach here. Yeah, no, I, 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 you know, jump on that. Uh, you know, certainly I would consider state transportation budget in, insufficient. I would consider a school construction budget insufficient. I mean, it's a dangerous, it's a dangerous slope. And, and to have that language in here, I agree completely with the chairman that you can't, it just leaves us wide open to Chris, because all the budgets seem insufficient in, in the current state of the law making office. Well, that's the word, it's not, the word isn't insufficient though, right? It's insufficient. That's right. Yeah, I don't understand that. Yeah. So in the, the, the contra, uh, uh, perspective is that if it's not in a su sufficient amount, then it's insufficient. Right. Okay. So it's, I, I just find the language dangerous. Well, is there a precedent for the state government to be requiring municipalities to sufficiently? Yeah, I mean, yeah. is there any precedent? You're probably looking to perpetual care funds and other trust funds that are held by trustees of public funds at the local level. Um, so, for example, there's a duty to appropriate enough money to maintain sufficiently these cemeteries that are under control of the cemetery commissioners at the local level. There's actually a bit of parity in play between libraries and cemeteries here, oh, and nice. that part of the funding for some of the municipal and nonprofit libraries that we're talking about do come from trust funds, mm -hmm. but those funds don't necessarily grow because there's a statutory list of investments that the trustees have to use for purposes of the res of the trust, and they diminish over time. So that's where the sufficiency clause here comes in, is if you have diminishing res for the libraries over here, it probably has to be level funded by the municipalities. 
And that's why earlier when I was talking about municipal funding, to my knowledge, and from what I remember from the report, I didn't memorize the 700 some odd pages, but that the primary funding sources for these libraries is the municipalities, even if they don't fully fund them. Thank you. I think um, it's it's less so the criticism that I'm worried about, more so the challenge that could be created for select boards here. Um, and I'm going to preface by saying I, I love libraries and I strongly support them, but you know, I'm thinking about if a town, you know, is let's say a bridge washes out and the library also has a leaky roof. And you know the town is trying to figure out it's trying to move around money to figure out what they're going to pay for, and they are required by law to fix the leaky roof before they address the bridge or they address uh, a broken light post in a uh, main street or something along those lines. Uh, so it's I mean you know, one one of the things that I hear from. You know, people who are serving on select boards and school boards is you know, unfunded mandates, and so that's yeah, that's one of the things that I am concerned about. Um, I do, philosophically, I do want to see every library well funded and operational, uh, but it's I think it, it feels like you know stepping into the realm of the select board and telling them what they shall spend money. That's my initial take on this. Still, Leo, did you want to? It sounds like the committee's in agreement on this. I don't know if you're not. Well, I haven't spoken yet, but I'll speak, I'll speak after Dr. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to note that these recommendations, or this this bill as it's drafted, again, really is only looking at the municipal public library section. And so, if the committee did change its minds in any way, I think there is an issue of. It sounds like you're leaning toward not including some of this language, but the the matter of incorporated public libraries, which are thirty percent of the public libraries, which serve the same function, there is no requirement that I'm aware of for any funding from a municipality to the incorporated public library in their town that serves their community. So, for example, here in Montpelier, they can put something on the ballot. But there's no requirement that any funding be given to the incorporated public libraries. And there's nothing in this bill that addresses that. But I think you should be aware of it because 30% is a large number of public libraries. And I think when people see a public library, they assume the municipality funded it and uh -huh. at a certain level. And they there's not necessarily that relationship. And with regards to funding, I also want to clarify something that came up in, in this room the other day around state funding. There is not, there, there was discussion around another part of this bill and it's funding from the state. Uh, there is not that type of funding. There's federal funding that the department gets up, but there's not actually state aid to public libraries. So I just want to be sure that that dynamic is understood and I'd be happy to come back at another time. I need to run upstairs for another yeah, of course, committee, of course. but I'd be happy to come back to this. this section. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Taylor. Okay. So thank you. Um, I don't mind being a lone dissenter here, by the way. Um, but I, it seems like two things. Like one, it seems like an outlook that a municipality has is that they get to define what sufficient is, right? So, well, you know, sufficient could be a moving target, I think. It could be defined by the municipality, but also. So can we just stand that for a second? It's just before. So, to Senator Gulick's point, <clears throat> Is it, that's true across state government? Uh, I mean, this is, is this tying people, locking their hands in a way? Municipalities. Yeah. Is this locking them in? Yeah, in some regards, but you've heard the conversation. It's some here, myself included, feel like, okay, we might be boxing a municipality in. Senator Drew is saying, okay, but the local municipality can define what sufficient is. So can you just help us get out of the box or stay I think in the you're box? gonna have to stay in the box of ambiguity because okay. you're gonna be hard pressed to find a case that will define sufficiency for purposes of municipal funding. 
Having said that, this is sufficiency for a wide range of purposes, maintenance, care, and increase. Sufficiency for increasing the library is going to be the most ambiguous. Sufficiency for maintaining the library is going to be the least. What are the current needs and what would be a sufficient amount of an appropriation to make sure that the library, for example, can stay open? That is likely going to be the basis for the legal test there. Yeah. You had a follow up also. I thank yeah. you um, for seeing that. I, yes. So that was my first point. My second point is simply now having served on the school construction aid task force, I'm really scared, worried to let buildings go decades without the support they need because then you end up in a position that we're in the schools where we've got you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions per year of deferred maintenance. And that is, you know, that's problematic. And I'm also, I live in a city right now that has a lot of abandoned and derelict buildings because we didn't keep up with the maintenance. And I can tell you, it is a huge problem. It's huge. So I just, I, I guess if there's any way we can avoid that and with and because we can define sufficient, I just think I don't know. I feel okay with this. That's, that's just my and I, but like I said, I'm happy being just well the sector. We all feel strongly the other way. But sufficient could mean thousand dollars if that's what they define. And there are other legal terms you right. can explore to replace sufficient that might better meet the policy decisions of the committee. Necessary is a lower standard than. Sufficient. Uh, I do agree with your point about buildings in this state. Um, Elected city council members. I mean, honestly, you know, it's like. I wonder if institutions should weigh in on that. Okay. Maybe. I think the League of Cities and Towns for sure. Yeah. So um, I'd, I'd simply like to add on to Senator Buehler's uh, point that. Uh, well, if anybody desires a state of uh, decaying municipal uh, or state facilities, it's just the economic reality of where we are. We can't afford everything. So that's that's kind of how we we are where we are. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. But this, that, and then to the other point about uh, sufficient, is there's two perspectives. There's the government perspective on what's sufficient, and that's the municipality boards and you know, et cetera. Then there's the citizen's perspective. And what I think we're, we're commenting on is that, uh, that, that they're never completely in balance. And if you're the citizen, you're going to say, this is not a sufficient amount to keep the facility intact, to run the program, et cetera. Uh, so whereas, so I think what, what we're trying to say is that we have to recognize that it, it puts the municipality into a bind uh, when they're confronted by the citizen who objects to the insufficiency of the funding. Along those lines, it sounds like, you know, anybody can sue over anything, but it does sound like we're creating some, some tension there where somebody, the Board of Trustees could say, this funding is insufficient, we're going to sue the select board in the town based on this. The, the proper remedy if you disagree with the budget at the local level is to take it out at the polling place in the following election. I, the likelihood of a private right of action resulting from this is low, but the likelihood of aggrieved voters thinking that the budget was not sufficient for their purposes if they vote for some of But I, I think it's my sense that we could accomplish the same, have the same effect with this legislation by even striking the word sufficient. If you read it, it's in amounts for blah, 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 blah. That is the underlying law. Perfectly. They just remove the ball. The duty right now is that they must appropriate something. Right. The new clause is the insufficient right amounts. Right. Um, Senator Buehler, any other but we've made a little progress. We're getting there. I actually am enjoying this bill. It's it's much more interesting. Is it because of me? No. <laughs> uh, 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 Mr. Anderson, maybe tomorrow, another 30 minutes if it works at some point. If not, we'll see you on Tuesday. All right. Unless, I mean, we're talking about the possibility of coming here Sunday. We'll be able to turn to <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah.
let me know. Okay. And Morgan had it to my guest there. Thank you. Sunday morning, 10 a.m. Okay. Appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Fisher, looking bright with your. Marty um, Are we live? We um, are. Actually, I should note this is, I was given this by your uh, counterpart, Mr. Chair, at the House. Uh, it's my yeah. understanding uh, oh, by the Chair of um, Education yeah, yes, yeah. Um, in, in the House. It's my understanding that one of his committee members may have uh, got married yesterday. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. I am yeah, on three. I'm con con conscious about saying anything on the record. It's not my news, but, uh, but I was given this. I'm wearing it proudly. Um, thank you. <laughs> so I left the office before um, knowing I was coming here. So uh, Morgan happily printed uh, the a a agency's implementation plan. And how do you want to? So firstly, I have announced who I am. That's an that's well. Before mistake. you before you even do that, I just want to. Uh, Dr. Boucher is supposed to be with us today. She can't be with us. So an emergency. Uh, completely understand. We asked Ted to come in and start to take us through uh, the CTE recommendations. And uh, got about 30 minutes to do that. So we're going to have you jump in and give us some highlights. And I would welcome if Ms. St. James has any questions as you're talking. Absolutely. To uh, feel free to raise them. Absolutely. Uh, so firstly, for the record, Ted Fisher, uh, Vermont Agency of Education. I'm the Agency uh, Director of Legislative Affairs, and I'm very glad to be with you today. I apologize that I am, again, stepping in for Secretary Boucher. Um, she sends her regrets, and she's looking forward to hopefully joining you guys next week when we have a draft. Um, so, and, and I will be happy to answer questions from, from Beth and from the committee. I think Beth and I are also going to chat as a sidebar to go over some of the language things. There is companion language that I'm not putting in front of you because we have some things to hire now. Um, so you, will, you should be seeing that next week. Yeah. Um, Senator Pulick, this question. Sorry, Todd, I know you're being started yet, and you're probably going to explain, but is, is this whole packet comment not good still? What bill do you have in front of you? The we have career and technical education bill, 207. 207. 207. It, it is. I did ask Morgan to provide to you um, H716 because, and if you remember, we, we did talk about this a couple weeks ago, Senator, I, with, with great appreciation to Senator Clarkson and the chair's sense of humor, um, the H207, or S207, excuse me, mentions that the agency shall bring this report, which we have brought. There is some language that we've already presented and, and requested from both your, from, from both from the Senate and from the House, and this, the House version has some of that language. And there's one caveat that I will signpost. So I also went over that. that and that's St. James. That's St. James Office of Legislative Council. I believe you have two CTE bills. We do. You have two S207, which is what Senator Clarkson introduced, yeah. and then you have a committee bill, S304. And they are the same, I believe. No. Not big no. change. The okay. committee bill actually contains not everything line by line, but almost everything that the House version that Ted is referencing right now contains, based solely on Ted's testimony from earlier in the session and Ailey's written recommendation. Beautiful. Thank you. And I'm so sorry for missing that point. Great. So it's got H716, and we have it in our committee bill. Is that three or four? So yeah. I don't mind telling you all that last week I got in trouble with the lieutenant governor and the secretary of the Senate because my pager goes off and it bypasses my silencing function. So I just put my phone on airplane mode so we don't get distra 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 distracted anymore. Um, um, here we go. So, um, okay. so what we're looking for is the committee bill. The committee? Yeah. Which is uh, best. My fault. Or... My fault. Oh, I should have provided yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I'm happy to go over some of those recommendations. Um, I did provide some testimony to you on those. Those include things like um, uh, moving rulemaking for CTE from the state board to the agency in the hopes that once we go through some of our government governance work next year, um, we, the agency will, will do rulemaking on this, which will be long overdue because it's been two decades. Um, some other work, um, and you'll actually note this as we kind of go through the 
the implementation plan. Um, there are places where we've already addressed some of these items. So, for example, a model, we have a model policy um, requirement uh, recommendation for you, which would be a model policy on career technical education that school districts would adopt that would help sort of navigate the guidance and making sure students are have access to career, uh, career technical education. They also have some requirements for um, middle school, and I'm going to say like early high school exposure to um, to students. We had previously talked about the committee, so I'm happy to refer to that and, and go back to it. I um, uh, and, and, and in S304, but um, I uh, was planning to go over the, the fiscal recommendations today because that was sort of our our goal um, from the APA report was to bring bring those this year and and um, respectfully punt on some of the governance ones. We are actually working with APA, who is who are the consultants who created the report as contracted by GFO, um, and uh, we're continuing to work with them in the hopes that we at the agency has now reached them. Um, to continue to work that governance things and bring those recommendations next year. So um, I think what might make the most sense for our thinking, my thinking, uh, speak for everyone, but maybe let's go back to say, what is it that you, if the administration is hoping to pass this year on CT, tell us that broad yeah. picture. Absolutely. So what exactly you're hoping you have the, the bill is coming, but just in your own words, absolutely. I run into a constituent. What is it that we're really hoping to do this year? So for that, um, page two, where it says summary of APA recommendation. Page two of the recovery report. Great, thank you. Um, and I also have the executive summary of the APA report as well here. Um, so so the, this is you can find that there as well. Um, so this APA. is uh, it's. Um, I don't actually know if they call themselves. I'm going to mess so, it up. Do we... Algen Blick, High Lock, oh, Associates. Yes, right. This is your, this has got your stamp on it. Right? Yes. So the, so just, sorry, to answer that question, going slightly back, you'll see at the top of page two, this plan is required pursuant to Act 127 of right. 2022, Section 17. That bill, um, that act required JFO to contract for a study. That study, JFO contracted with APA. That study was delivered to the agency. The agency was required to do an implementation plan. Um, we are delivering this implementation plan late. I think that hindsight is twenty twenty. The timeline on that was probably insufficient, but I understand the urgency, which we also share. Um, and so we are now bringing that. We also have an ongoing working relationship with the work, with the the, the contractor to, to bring. You. That and to, just to be clear, what you're going to talk to us about right now is what you hope exactly will pass exactly. this year. Exactly. Okay. So, um, summary of APA recommendations. On them, so they, they, this is how they crosswalk it, and I'm just going to briefly tell you what we're hoping to do for each of these items, um, and uh, and then we'll get, then we can dive into them um, either through the report or through the bill more um, more directly. So, uh, funding. Um, Incentives or grants to improve the accessibility for students from schools that do not share a campus with a CTE center. I have my green book back there. There's already a grant um, under 16 via Title 16 that gives funding from schools to schools to transport students to um, CTE centers. We're asking you to require us to study that and determine whether or not we should adjust the um, funding ratio. It is one a dollar fifty in nineteen ninety eight dollars adjusted for inflation. I believe it's around three three dollars and change now. I asked Nicole, we are director of finance. Number one is a study, yes. and it's just transportation Come back next year. Yes, and this is transportation aid to school districts and not to CTE. We're right. going to be talking a lot about direct funding to CTE and changes how CTE is funded. Yeah. This is asking us to look into whether or not we need to change the transportation monies for schools and see the state school transportation is kind of its own area so that makes sense for us to look into that very specifically in terms and not change it as part of our changes to how we fund ct centers themselves and just everyone else that's s 304 the committee bill on cps okay and also so all right so cool number one is transportation to school districts as a study as a study, study. Yeah. okay um Item two is create a facilities funding system for CTE centers. 
This is part of most, a lot of the meat and potatoes or the tofu and kale of this report. Um, it is moving from a model where we have a tuitioning system where school where CTP centers charge tuition based on costs to um, school districts, and then the state has several provisions of additional aid that we then direct directly. We're talking about over a period of several years, moving away from that, and we're going to directly allocate funding from the education fund to CTE centers based on a regional um, an understanding on a statewide basis of the cost of the programs. Just to dive into that a little bit more. No, hold on. Is this yes. a study also? No. Or, so we would like no, we want appropriations language. to create a fund, no dollar amount, but create some fund that will even no, to... no fund. We're looking to do with a two-year phasing uh -huh. to create a new section of law that essentially um, okay. extends the funding. And what AOE would do is calculate the uh, cost per student per program. So for example, and I'm using an example where a CTE director who's listening might be like, oh my gosh, Ted has got it totally wrong. But for example, Burlington Technical Center has an aviation program. That's an expensive program to operate. Right, so you've got nursing programs that are expensive, and and um, we've got uh, uh, truck and trades programs that have lots of lumber costs and other things. So every program is different in terms of the cost for student operates. So what we're looking to do is over the period of several years, we'll be gathering data. We have already gathered significant data on student on students um, program participation as well as the funding costs. We're asking them to disaggregate that by program. And then um, we will use that to calculate on a statewide basis. So every school district in the state will have the opportunity um, to receive the same allocation based on real costs for each student participating in a program. Sarah, um, just a little confused on tactics here. Mm -hmm. So I, I get the report, at least you know as far as we've gotten into it. But I'm wondering the language that you're talking about. Is it embedded in one of the two bills that's already on the table? No, it's, it's to come. That's to come. So we, as part of this report, also drafted some language. We're working with Beth on that. We were, um, that is going to be hopefully ready for next time. Okay. Just well, I just, Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Yeah, and I apologize. I, I should have sounded close to that more directly, which is, we this language came later because we, we requested from the proponents a little more time. To the Senator, do it. Thank you. Is this to do with the money follows the student argument or is that number three? I keep hearing that one of the problems with CTE funding is that the money follows the student. Is that what I'm not talking about? No. Um, and I actually, I skipped over one there, so I'll have to come back to two. I, I haven't used those words correctly myself, but I've definitely heard the argument. So the but what what APA says is to design a funding system that treats all CTE equitably while incentivizing additional CTE capacity in high growth sectors, use like utilizing a weighted student funding formula, difference funding by CTE program. Okay. And so that incentivization thing is interesting. So and just so you know, literally we have like 15 minutes right. for this. So I mean, I we're looking Understood. for a big overview today. Under going to come back to this. And again, Jody might come back and be like, there are many reasons why this wouldn't work, but um we have um the career the Central Vermont Career Technical Center mm -hmm. is a very short number of road miles up an admittedly large hill from the state airport in Berlin. There is no reason potentially that aside from administrative barriers, why they couldn't also have an aviation program. So the goal is to try to put all CT centers in Vermont on equal footing to match need, to match student interest to programs, right? So, and essentially it, it would help them address some of the upfront costs of starting up one of the more expensive programs because the money that, this, that, that the state will be directing to the program better matches the cost to educate one student in that particular program. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. This is important incentivization. There's another incentivization question that I think we have some language about potentially studying for the out years, which is the idea of the state actually putting its thumb on the scale and saying these this set of programs should get an additional three, you know, what additional set of dollars per student on an annual basis because we want more students in that program and want to incentivize CT centers opening up capacity. That's a decision that could be made, it's a policy decision. 
it's not one that we, we want to move to this model first, but that it could be something to consider in the future. So um, create a facilities funding system for CT centers, actually item recommendation number two from the APA report. And there is already conversations about facilities funding occurring in this building. So we have introduced intent language. You will find it in S304. That just says that it's the intent of the General Assembly that to include CT centers. I will note because uh, we talked to each other um, that uh, that the um, report of the task force or the working group on school facilities funding includes recommendations. So we're, that's all we're doing. That's all we want to do for that. We don't have to create a second duplicate effort. Um, so uh, we have some policy elements, aligned calendars and academic requirements in CTE regions. Um, so we have some recommendations about um, strengthening some of the powers and duties of regional advisory boards to start doing some of this work with a specific uh, interest in working on bell times. So we have CTE regional calendars already, but we often don't have common bell times. And I learned a new word when I started doing this, getting into the CTE works, which is bell times. Not every not every school ends a period at the same time. So the idea would be at a certain common time across the region, all the students are done with second period and they all can go off to CTE. Um, so that's one of our recommendations. Um, there is a recommendation to review CTE teacher preparation, licensure requirements, and compensation to attract skilled professionals. Um, we are um, not bringing a recommendation on that. This, oh no, excuse me, we are bringing a recommendation on that this year. Um, there's a state capacity uh, question for additional staffing at AOE to support career technical education. In the governor's recommended budget, there is one FTE for the AOE CTE team, and we um, would appreciate the committee's consideration and potential mm -hmm. communicating with your colleagues at the other end of the building to support that when the budget comes through. What does that TE stand for? Excuse me, full-time equipment. I apologize. It's, it's our nomenclature for one position. Um, so it, we say one FTE, but it, we mean one position. Okay. And that would be an education programs coordinator for career technical education. Um, we have a state capacity required. This is another recommendation of theirs required that career exploration be offered to middle school students. That language is already drafted in an S304. Um, we have a state capacity to encourage greater secondary and post-secondary collaboration. We have that in S304 as well. I'm sorry, I don't have the section numbers from S304 in front of me, but we have a requirement that okay. starting off with yeah. a certain set of programs, including education, um, I think construction trades and two others, we require the AOE to work with the Vermont State College of System. Um, and then larger systems change, this is 9 and 10. Review distribution of programs and consider offering programs outside of CTE centers and create either a coordinated regional governance structure or a single district for CTE. And those are the two that we're punting on for this year. We want to bring those back next year. We have intent language. So 9 and 10, not this year. Next year. Next year. So we want to do the funding, get the funding and statutes start transition. We do have some language that we've proposed um, in both the House and the Senate that says that all of this is contingent on the legislature doing governance work next year, so it would sunset um, or essentially not allow the programs to take effect. So you could consider that as a potential hook to make sure that um, a new legislature coming in next year and beginning of the next biennium is attentive to this. I'm going to pause for questions. Right. Navigation. So uh, questions. So that's a good overview, Ted, of things that are in 304 as well as things that you're working with that on to include the 304. So what will, it makes sense, what we'll do is we're gonna have you back next week yeah. when Beth takes us through all of 304 and yes. says, hey, this is this is our CTE bill, and then we can start to have some witnesses come in next week as well. Um, any questions for Mr. Fisher? Good effort. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Terrific. Okay, committee, let's just take five minutes and then we're going to come back. We're going to have shift to, uh, uh, what's it called? Yeah, Dolly, uh, uh the imaginary imagination library. Thank you. Welcome back to Senate Education. Uh, we have a real treat today.
We're looking at S304 and app related scores for Mont's young readers, but specifically, we are looking at the imagination library part of the bill. We have uh, an all star team, including our former colleague, Senator Cheryl Hooker, who used to serve on this committee. Uh, we're going to kick it off with Nora Briggs. We're very excited, uh, Ms. Briggs, to virtually welcome you to Vermont. Where where are we finding you? Actually, today I'm in Palm Beach. I'm in Palm Beach, Florida today. Uh -huh. Wow. Nice. Okay. Same yes. weather down there, I'm sure, that we're experiencing up here in Vermont. <laughs> Maybe just a tad different. <laughs> I, I was hoping to join you today in person, but the travel just did not work out. Well, it's very kind of you to take the time. We're thrilled to have you here, albeit virtually, and would, at, if you ever are in Vermont, we hope you will uh, take the time and come visit us here at the State House. It would be a real pleasure to welcome you. But we're excited to hear uh, your thoughts on the bill that's been put together, as well as uh, we likely will have some questions. So please, the floor is yours. Perfect, thank you. So let me first by saying that Dolly sends her greetings and she I thanks you for considering expansion of her imagination library across to all young learners in Vermont. And we agree, nothing is more basic, more essential, more foundational to a child's success in life than the ability to read. The research and science is very clear. We cannot wait for kindergarten for children to have access and exposure to books and reading. We need to reach them early. And reading at this age, under five, happens primarily at home. And reading at home requires books. And we know that not all families have access nor can provide books. So this is where we can help. Dolly Parton's Imagination Library is a contactless home book gifting program for children zero to age five, their fifth birthday. They receive an age appropriate down to the month age, high quality book with their name on it every month at home, no cost to the family. And we know that books in the home lead to increased kindergarten readiness, changes in the home literacy environment, with families connecting around the book and all family members focused on reading. Significantly stronger reading, math, and science academic outcomes, both starting in third grade and continuing on, we track children all the way through kindergarten, higher high school graduation rates. We know that simply getting the books into the home starts the, the change and the change in the trajectory of the lives of the kids and families and communities. A statewide program provides more benefits to the state than a collection of local programs. County level program partners ensure statewide coverage for all zip codes, equitable access for all families to early learning resources. Children start kindergarten with a shared experience and helps level the playing field. This creates a shared bond with children across neighborhoods, communities, race, and economic differences. It starts to help break the division at an age when children notice the differences between themselves and other children. They all receive the same books. It's a special gift. It's an instant bonding. We partner with state agencies to find the most vulnerable and underrepresented families. Special program for foster care children, Babies born to parents who are in a correctional or other type of facilities, and that could be an adult or a youth who has a child under five, um, working with WIC and other agencies to find the families that most need help to have books in their home. We partner with the state birthing ho hospitals to enroll at birth. Children come in right when they're born, receiving a book every month, so they can have a collection of 60 books into their home by the time they graduate out partnership with the State Department of Education, if you like, to flag Imagination Library participants. Most states put a flag on the student master record card, which indicates that they were an Imagination Library. That helps track participants, tracks also the return on investment by the state and program effectiveness. We find that schools also use it to plan the remedial and one-on-one -on -one tutoring that's necessary in kindergarten based on the saturation rates of children getting books in the school districts. 
partnership with the state and local library system, right? With that aim to tie and focus library usage for all family members. All families that have library cards with children under five and imagination library, all children and families with children should have local library cards. Ties to adult literacy and dual language programs. We place a multi-generational focus on literacy as the best way to learn to read is children's picture books. Best way to learn a new language, children's picture books. And it's simple, we're connecting adult literacy to the books that are coming into the home. We can sometimes do a fun state level focus on family time and reading. One example is the Drive with Dolly license plate campaign. We put Dolly's face on a license plate in the state of Vermont. We focus on reading, we do billboard campaigns. And of course, all the funds generated that would come back to a community go to the local program partner to help um, pay for their local community share. There's also an estate program an opportunity if you like to layer on other family resources. Some states do book buses using the Imagination Library books and then connecting and partnering them with food and medical. Statewide programs are special. We also do story time out in the parks with the Department of Recs and bring books into the community, people to the parks, all focused on reading and family fun. State programs work at a state level to fundraise and help local communities so there are never children on waiting lists. And if there's a budget deficit in a coming year, they have mitigation funds to ensure that the program continues. A statewide program ensures equitable access, providing increased opportunity for improving statewide kindergarten readiness, academic achievement, and creates a state focus on literacy. But really, the program is special. Dolly calls this, this is her heart program. It really is about connecting hearts in the home, in the families, connecting to each other with snuggling and cuddling that happens. The book is the tool. It's about creating a love, a sense of security and comfort that comes from the book coming into the home. And really, Dolly just wants to help create a love for books and reading and make sure that every Vermont child has access to equitable access in books and learning, really providing the best start they can have in education and in life. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Briggs. And uh, while, just after you started, uh, Senator Starr joined us uh, and he's uh, the lead sponsor of this initiative. Uh, and so he may have some questions as we go along as well. Any questions for uh, Ms. Briggs from the, uh, who's with the Dollywood Foundation at this point? Any questions? Do you have any questions? Well, is, is Nora going to be with us? Yeah, you're going to be able to stick around? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Top priority for Dolly and the Foundation. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Terrific. Uh, so now we are shifting and we have... Um, uh, Ms. Campbell, Shire Kids, Vermont. Hi. Hey. Hi. Thank you so much for including me today. Um, I'm really grateful to be here. Uh, so. So we're, um, we're, please go ahead. Did you have some uh, testimony that you wanted to share with us? I do. I'll, I'll proceed. Um, so thank you to the Committee on Education for hearing my testimony in support of Senator Starr's bill. I also want to thank Senator Brian Campion for your ongoing and dedicated support of early literacy in Southern Vermont and Representative Kathleen James for guiding my earliest explorations of seeking a statewide imagination library and Representative Woody Page for his earnest attempt at a statewide program two years ago with House Bill H636. Um, I'm Nicole Campbell, Executive Director of Shire Kids. We're the local affiliate for Dolly Parton's Imagination Library. Um, we serve Bennington County, Western Wyndham County, and a few proximal towns in Rutland and Windsor counties for a current total enrollment of 1,114 children in Dolly Parton's Imagination Library. So my written testimony includes more information on my background, how I became involved in the Imagination Library, and I really appreciate the committee's time to read through all of the submitted written testimony from me, and I know several others who have prepared um, written testimony. But for now, I want to focus on how Dolly Parton's Imagination Library can impact children all around Vermont. 
Nora just shared so much useful and helpful information on how the Dollywood Foundation works directly with the states and evidence of the value and success of the Imagination Library in helping literacy is overwhelming. The Dollywood Foundation focuses on identifying common outcomes for all Imagination Library programs. So this means that the impact of this program in Vermont will reflect successes seen in other states with longstanding statewide programs. Research-based outcomes that are documented through several studies on the DPIL website reflect how this program establishes building blocks for lifelong literacy and how it supports the research on evidence-based literacy. So I'm so grateful, um, Senator Starr, that this program, the Statewide Imagination Library Program, is being proposed within a comprehensive bill to improve how children in Vermont are taught how to read. In a seven days article written by Allison Novak um, from last fall, neuroscience professor Reed Lyon told a group of lawmakers that effective teaching should begin with clear systematic instruction in the sounds that are contained within words and how those sounds connect to print. Building that strong foundation in those two skills known as phonemic awareness and phonics is an essential step to becoming a successful reader. And the National Reading Panel considers phonemic awareness and phonics, along with vocabulary, comprehension, and fluency, the five pillars of effective reading instruction. So this brings me back to imagination library books. So every parent has heard that you are your child's first teacher. And in fact, engaging parents and families is an important policy position at the Vermont Agency of Education. Families are empowered to be a better teacher to their children with Imagination Library books. Each book, and I see you have one right in front of you, Senator Starr, um, by a local author, they have a front or back panel with guidance on how to make the books come alive. The books have expert but accessible guides to help parents engage with their children by introducing elements of the five pillars of effective reading instruction even before the child is explicitly taught how to read. One of the books selected by the Blue Ribbon Book Selection Committee is Shh, Bear Sleeping by our Northeast Kingdom author, James Martin. He shared with the local Northeast Kingdom affiliate that the special book flaps are added to some of the best picture books in the world and remind parents that young children learn through play. So through a combination of play and introducing elements of the five pillars of effective reading instructions, children will have increased early literacy behaviors, which is a foundation for school success. Uh, a scholastic research compendium found that 61% of low-income families have no children's books at home. Having books in the home leads to more reading. A uh, California professor of early literacy, Dr. Susan Neufeld, who was an early supporter and she was an important leader in the introduction of a statewide program uh, for Dolly Parton's Imagination Library in California, she shared her research, research showing evidence that providing books to children that they own is highly impactful. A study done by Clark and Poulton for the National Literacy Trust, which explored the correlation between book ownership and behaviors and attitudes of children toward reading found that children who own books were more likely to visit the library, enjoy reading and read more frequently. Children who did not own books, did not enjoy reading, did not visit the library. So without access to books of their own, young people were less likely to have positive experiences of reading, less likely to do well at school, and less likely to be engaged in reading of any form. Imagination library books are owned by Vermont children and will stay with them even if they move in with grandparents and aunt or uncle or spend time with a foster family. Again, I'm so grateful and thank you to Senator Starr. Thank you to the Senate Education Committee. Thank you, Ms. Nora Briggs for your presence here today and everyone I've worked with over the past five years who love helping young children prepare for life. Thank you, Nicole. And I remember you filled me in on this years ago now, time flies. Uh, so <laughs> it's, it's, it's great of you to be with us and talk to us a little bit about the successes it's had down in our neck of the woods. Um, I think we are now shifting to, uh, I think, Ms. Gamble. I didn't know, Cheryl, if you wanted to say a few words before I jump in or? Whatever works for you, Cheryl. No, whatever works. 
<laughs> that might be a good idea because I really have the least experience here with the Dolly Parton Imagination Library. I'm on the committee with Joan. Joan is our chair, but I'm learning so much listening to Miss Briggs and to Miss Campbell. This is such a wonderful program. And I just wanted to say a couple of things about it. First of all, thank you, Senator Starr, for introducing this and bringing it to the Ed Committee and for the Ed Committee adopting this and making it part of your more comprehensive liter literacy improvement bill that you have going through. Um, it's this easily accessible, cost-effective program that extends from cradle to kindergarten is proved to establish a culture of literacy, not only for our youngest students, but their families as well. As Ms. Briggs and Ms. Campbell have pointed out, families will read. I know my own children read to their children, and they have lots of time together snuggling, but also snackling as my granddaughter will say because she's always looking for some cookies but this is a the type of in uh, the type of engagement we want to see in all families i just want to add a little bit to what ms campbell was saying about the article that allison novak did back in october of 2023 she said that today only about half of the vermont third graders in our state read proficiently and the results are far worse for children of color and those with disabilities or living in poverty. So this program really would ensure that our kids are getting a better foundation before they even get to school. She went on to say that the stakes are high, low literacy is linked to a host of negative effects, including poor health, poverty, and incarceration. And there are less obvious costs. Being unable to read proficient, proficiently causes deep hurt and shame. <clears throat> so as I said, I'm new to this program, and I'm happy to be part of it, but I know a lot less than these three wonderful women here. So I'll just hand it over to Joan to let you talk, let her talk a little bit about what we've been doing in Rutland. Well, thank you. Um, I'm Joan Gamble, and I'm a strategic change consultant and the champion of the Imagination Library at the Rutland Free Library. I'm honored to testify in favor of this bill, especially in front of two senators from Rutland County, Senator Weeks and Senator Williams. I learned, I learned about the Dolly Parton Imagination Library, or DPIL, in December of 2020 during the pandemic when I read an article about the Imagination Library in Brandon. And my first reaction was, Brandon? What about Rutland? And so I spoke to Kyle Hutchins, who started the Brandon program during his paternity leave after learning that his baby was not eligible for the program that was offered in Addison County. As a strategic change consultant who works a lot with nonprofits, I knew the questions to ask before starting a new program. The same questions you should ask as you consider this bill. Is there a need? Is this program the best way to fill the need? Are there others filling the need? And what does it take to run a program? After extensive due diligence about the DPIL, it became clear to me that this was an evidence-based program that would cost-effectively address literacy issues. Investing in early literacy is the key to addressing overall literacy problems since 90% of brain development occurs in the first three years of a child's life. The logic model supporting DPIL which I attached to my written testimony, shows kindergarten readiness is a key outcome of the program. DPIL has a database of 39 research reports on their website, imaginationlibrary.com, showing that kindergarten readiness affects children, especially at-risk children, in the short term and the long term. A study by the Arkansas De Department of Education tracked children who participated in the program versus those who did not participate. And participating children showed 29% increase in kindergarten readiness, 
but also significantly stronger reading skills and higher reading achievement tests over non-participating peers consistently through third grade. The Kansas Emporia School District followed participating and non-participating children and showed consistently higher performance all the way through ninth grade. In talking to education and social service agencies, it became apparent that there was no other organization filling this need in the Rutland area. My next step was to figure out what it really takes to run a local program. DPIL has a detailed handbook of what's needed to run a program. In addition, people running other local affiliates like Nicole Campbell, who runs the Shire Kids uh, serving Bennington County and is testifying today, were a tremendous help. To start a program, you need a partner with a local 501c3 or a library or a school so that you can have access to the bulk mailing rate. I chose the Rutland Free Library as a partner to serve the five towns in their catchment area, Rutland City, Rutland Town, Menden, Tinmouth, and Ira. In order to start a program, the local affiliates need to raise funds to cover at least the first six months of operating the program. I gave numerous presentations to local organizations showing how cost-effective it was due to economies of scale, scale provided by partnering with the Dolly Parton Foundation. As a result, I was able to enlist the support of the United Way of Rutland County and two local Rotary Clubs and sustaining support from Rutland City Schools who use federal monies to reimburse us the cost of mailing books to participating children in Rutland City every month. Since we began mailing books in April of 2021, we've mailed 12,507 free books to children in the five towns. We are currently mailing 460 books to 460 children every month. Our dedicated team of volunteers, including Cheryl, is focused on getting all children under five in the five towns we serve to participate, especially at-risk children. This requires ongoing marketing efforts since every month children graduate on their fifth birthday, so we need to keep finding new children to participate. We do this through ongoing marketing efforts via Facebook, newspaper articles, being visible at local events like National Night Out, local public access television, and by partnering with local agencies like the Birthing Center at Rutland Regional Medical Center, local pediatric offices, schools, and local daycares. We especially focus our efforts on getting at-risk children to participate by encouraging all agencies like DCF, the Parent Child Center, and Head Start to sign up children. We pay extra to have the post office mail us undelivered books. And then we've been collaborating with the Rutland Homeless Prevention Center to give books to children experiencing homelessness since they do not have an address for us to mail them books. I enthusiastically support your bill and the effort to bring the Dolly Parton Imagination Library to all children under five in the state. The Dollywood Foundation partnership makes the program incredibly cost-effective and easy to administer to achieve these evidence-based results. Thank you. Thank you. That's great testimony. Questions for any any of our uh, guests, our witnesses, Ms. Briggs. If you don't mind, I'm wondering how many have other states moved in this direction of sort of doing it statewide. Yes, um, we currently have 20 states that have long-term state commitment with us. Uh, we're getting ready to launch the state of Oregon, which will make our 21st state. Perfect. And I have eight other states that are pursuing legislation and looking at this as part of their own state's literacy focus. We're basically a tool in your toolkit. Right. What we're good at is getting books in the home. Yeah, that's great. Other questions? Senator Stark. Yeah, the only thing I would say is you just heard 
the best testimony I've heard in regards to this, uh, you know, from uh, from Noor to Nicole, you know, these people have been doing the heavy lifting and, you know, you've heard the results and uh, most of you in here don't know me very well, I wouldn't say, other than in the last few months, other than your chair. But uh, I've been here a long time and and I don't take subject matters lightly. Uh, if I'm going to put my name on, on a bill, it's a bill that is capable of passing this institution that we're all part of. And over the years, uh, or I should back up and say, last summer when I was approached about this particular bill, um, and if you look, you'll see the number on my bill is quite a lot higher than if I'd introduced it right away. Um, and that was because I was doing a lot of research on the bill before I put my name on it. And, you know, in, in all that research, uh, I mean, I didn't find one one negative aspect to it. Uh, every bit of it was positive. And, and I spent a lot of years on the local school board and the supervisory union, you know, all the things that we do before we get here. And, you know, you read any statistic and our children are not learning very well. And I think that's why Brian and you folks have put together a strong literacy bill uh, to try to help do that and get our children uh, back to reading and understanding uh, the English language and being uh, being able to converse with people and and you know I I couldn't find one bad thing about this bill and, and about the Dolly Parton Foundation. And, um, you know, I, I just think for the money that, I mean, our budget's $8.6 billion. And, and you know, 100,000, 150 grand is pretty small numbers to take a chance on helping our children so they aren't incarcerated and they don't spend their day in the principal's office or uh, wherever they keep them now. It used to be the principal's office when, when I was on the school board. Um, but if we get them started right, kids aren't born bad, but you, you take and just put a little electronic machine in front of them when they're babies and they get used to pushing buttons instead of listening to the uh, stories being read to them, you're going to end up with children. Well, we're ending up with them. And uh, so I I just want to, you know, commend Nora for uh, being on today and the other three women and Cheryl, we spent quite a few years together, and uh, when Cheryl was here as a rep and as a senator, uh, so she knows the story anyways, but uh, boy, I, I can't think of another, another issue that would be as important as this one, helping our children into the future. It's very cute. I don't know how well you know Senator Starr, but he has been a big advocate for children his entire career. And I would, I would also say, children that um, don't always come with as much as other children. You know, mm -hmm. uh, moderate, low-income kids recognizing their needs. Yeah.
Um, and thank you so much, Senator Starr, and thank you, committee. Um, one of the reasons this program really works well is it is a gift. It is not a charity. That's why we ask for the state to partner with the communities in a 50-50 public-private partnership. The Dollywood Foundation pays a vast majority of the cost, but we do want a small community piece because Dolly feels that if you give away something for free, people don't always value it as much. They don't have skin in the game. So we, we love partnering with local communities that care about getting books right into the homes and hearts of their, their family members and their communities. And at a state level, when you offer it for all children, your grandchildren and nieces and nephews and um, you know your own children of all ages and all communities, it's that gift element. It's the gift from the state of Vermont. It's the gift from a local community and from Dolly that really helps make it work. Most states that come in, their goal is to get to 65 or 70% of all the zero to five children. That's a lot of children. Um, right now we're less than, we're about 18% of all the children. So we think about every month that goes by, there's a child who's aging five and won't get a book in this program, may not have any books in their home. So we thank you for supporting, just even considering it and thinking about it. Um, we've got a lot of experience over the last 30 years doing it with states in conjunction with our local program partners. And the goal is to make it feel special. The goal is to find, and that's what brings in the underrepresented families. We have lots of states who will let us know that they get families who kind of come back and say, they've been getting a, a book every month from Dolly. We got it at the hospital. And what else do you have for our families? What else do you have for my kids that are like this? You build this wonderful relationship because there's no means test. There's no proving you should have a book or need a book. It comes as a gift as a parent opts in. Some states are getting focused on doing a birth certificate enrollment. So when families enroll it for the birth certificate, it's an opt-in right there when they're getting the birth certificate. That, that way they... They know that kids are getting it, but it's just this wonderful gift that comes from the state, partnered with the local community. All children get it from all communities. And sometimes we get some of the feedback about um, children who have books and can afford them. This is where that shared gift, kids coming to kindergarten from communities that are gated communities, maybe HUD homing, farms, rural communities, suburban, urban, they've all gotten the same book. It levels the playing field. It's, you're my best friend. I've got that book, that's my favorite book too. It changes the dynamic right when they come to kindergarten. It's really the place they learn other people have more or less than themselves. It's just one of those very rare, feel good things to work on. Uh, this is my dream job. I came in after corporate sector. I don't have a background in education. I'm a I'm a, a passionate about reading and lifelong learning. But I know that when you make something feel special, people treat it special and we get to bring in the families that they just don't know they need it yet, right? But when we help them find the program and they sign up and it's free and they don't have to prove that they need it, that's the special gift that lasts. It, this is a legacy item. This is something really special. Oh. We are and super the books, excited. And the, books the, are, are, the books are beautiful, I have to say. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. I brought uh, David uh, Martin, the guy from West Berlin. And he wrote to us also. He oh, he did. Some emails yeah. Yeah. In, your, uh, uh, in your package. I'll join our, Do many of the hospitals uh, in other states get involved where they sign the parents up right away? Yes, they do. It's a wonderful thing for our hospitals. We only got like 14. Yes. yes. I'd like to go back to Ms. Briggs' comments about the, sh the shared um, interest in the books, the bonds, and maybe you can talk about the book that the kids get when they graduate and what that does to their first day of kindergarten when some teachers ask. That's, that's good. Thank you. So the first book they get, regardless of what age they come into the program, is The Little Engine That Could, ah. which 
is one of Dolly's favorite. And what it does, it sets the tone for the program. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Then they get a book that's age appropriate down to their month. It is a national book gifting program. So children across the entire United States, if they are 28 months old, they get the same book. We do not collect demographic data, economic data, gender data. This is about inspiring a love of books and reading. And they get a book a month. And on their fifth birthday, they get um, a letter from Dolly. They also get an email with a graduation song, Right to the Child, which basically tells them to keep reading, dreaming, learning, being more, caring more, so they can be something. They ask them to go down to the local library if they're not already, to make sure they get a library card. And when they get to school, to make sure the first thing they do is go to the library, check out, <laughs> check out a book at school, keep learning. But that last book they get is Look Out Kindergarten, Here I Come which prepares them for the change and being at home and learning in the home environment to learning in a school. And a lot of kindergarten teachers around the country, that's the book they hold up on the first day. And they know immediately which kids have gotten the same book. They can almost start to segment the children that are going to need more help based on that. I've got that book. It's my favorite book. And they know that they, they've been prepared. And meanwhile, you've got the heart piece. I don't ever want to forget the heart piece because it is, if we all think back to how, if we have good memories of reading, a lot of it probably started on the parents, on the laps of our parents or grandparents, people we love. And part of the specialness of the program is the fact that the tool, the book is the tool and families are gathering together around that when they're little and it's singing and talking and hug, you know, hugging and snuggling. And they're reading. And it's the sense of feeling of comfort and security that I like that. It comes with the reading. You're imprinting the good feel around reading. Um, we recently saw a survey that's being published very soon around kids are reading less for fun. They're not enjoying reading and they're actually not reading for fun. And somewhere along the line, they're thinking about skills and drills and all the things that come academically, but having the book in the home where it's just about reading and snuggling and making fun of words and different voices and all of these things helps cement just so simply. I mean, I remember where I fell in, in love with reading. It's on my grandfather's lap. I remember it. I remember the sense of comfort and security and I just became a reader and I do believe readers typically have higher success in life because they can read. And I just, we just want that for everybody to have access to it. It's as simple as that. Thank you, Ms. Briggs. Any other questions uh, for our uh, guests today? Thank you all, Ms. Briggs, please, um, from all of us, thank Ms. Parton. I mean, her, uh, she has done so much, and this is just another example. And please extend a warm welcome, I mean, extend our invitation sure. for her to come for a warm welcome if she's ever in Vermont or would like to come to Vermont. And we extend the same invitation to you, of thank course, you. we'd love to have you here at the State House. And, show you our, our state. When we do the signing. When Senator the Starr, right, when, when the governor signs the bill, Senator Starr will say, <laughs> and if Dolly Parton has any questions, I'll give you Senator Starr's cell phone number. <laughs> he will <laughs> answer it at any time for Dolly Parton. Maybe not for some of us, but for Dolly Parton, I know he will pick up. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, Thank you so much. Thank, thank you all so much. Thank you, right. Cheryl. Thanks, Joan. Thanks, Nicole. Great to see all of you. It was terrific. So this lady uh, walked in with me. She did you just start a program in St. Albans? I so um, for the record, Amy Johnson. I'm I'm from Vermont Care Partners, um, but I was formerly at the Parent Child Center up at NCSS in St. Albans. And after my daughter um, went through five years of the Dolly program, and still now eight and a half loves. She reads. Every night, all the time, she's a big reader. It's great. Up in St. Albans, we said, how can we get more books to kids? How can we make sure that everybody builds this type of library? 
And so we started it, it's during the pandemic and it's been running for almost three years now. And we have probably 2000 kids enrolled. It supports all of Franklin County, all of Grand Isle County, hugely successful um, and probably one of the most um, things I'm the most proud of starting up at the Parent Child Center in St. Albans before I left. So not How there many anymore, but say? about 2000. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And when we, when we enrolled, when you go and I met with a rep from Dolly's, uh, the national team, and we said, well, this is like how much it's going to cost you each year because this is how much we, pr what percentage we project each year signing up. When we launched the program, there were already people on a waiting list in those two counties waiting to be enrolled. So they automatically, like immediately had at least 200 kids enrolled. And we went from, we, we did not follow the like, five-year trend line we just went straight up and had you know a, like over 50 percent within the first maybe two years so it's it's an incredible program everybody who I interface with I was the director of the parent child center but I kept hold of being the coordinator for the Dolly program so I was the one who personally enrolled everybody and got to interface with the families Nobody has a negative thing to say about it. It is fantastic. Um, just an all-star program, super supportive of kids, of families. Um, so I, I'm really excited. I had to find time in my day today oh, doing oh, oh, for my care partner so stuff nice. to be here to, to listen in and just really excited about the folks who were able to testify. I've worked on and off with these folks for the past couple of years as we've been trying to to get this off the ground for the state. So right. thank you very much to the committee and to Senator Starr. Thank well, you. Well, they would have done it anyways. I just happened to have my name on the field. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Any final comments from uh, Joan, Nicole, or, or Cheryl before we close? Okay. Thank you all for joining us. We're going to take Let's a see. five minute break. Thank you. Uh, You'll take us off. Okay. Welcome back to Senate Education, Thursday, February 15th, 326. Ms. Carmoli. Thank once you. Once again, thank you for coming over, making the time to address an incredibly important issue. We have some decisions that we need to make on 204 if you've followed uh, some of the testimony, but we know you have some comments on 204. Okay. Compliments, I think, also. I do. We love to hear. Well, we might even put a sign on the door of compliments only. Okay. <laughs> I do love positive. So thank you so much. I'm Gwen Carmoli. I uh, serve as the chair of the Advisory Council on Literacy for the State. I'm also the president of the Vermont Curriculum Leaders. And you saw my amazing superintendent yesterday, Amy Minor. Oh, I work uh, with sure Amy Minor. I'm the director of curriculum in Colchester. So I'm extremely far fortunate to represent a number of terrific organizations. Um, I would say I can read through this, but really I have three main comments. One is thank you. You're doing a really, really important and, and fine job of raising the awareness of the supports for literacy for struggling learners and helping us align that with our existing requirements. And I would say both are really, really important. So thank you so much for that. Um, my second comment is about that alignment. There's one area that is still slightly out of alignment, and that is the area about the universal dyslexia screener, and it's in relation to the, the language, and I have some suggested language for that. I've uh, spoken to the Vermont, um, the VCSEA, the Vermont Council of Special Education Administrators, and then my last was just a clarification point. So I, if you would like me to, I can read through the testimony or I, we So can, you want to start with yeah. the, whatever the, it's the committee's preference, but uh, you mentioned something. What was the first point? Uh, thank you so much. And oh, I, I love that. All right. Let's go back. Second, well, let's go to the second point. Okay. The second point was about the dyslexia screener itself okay. or the process for screening. Okay. This, um, some of the language that is in the draft, the, the original and the second draft, bump up against the process of identifying students for a disability. And so there's a process that's outlined in multi-tiered systems of support that say we have to teach, 
and assess and provide layers of support. And when that doesn't work, then you um, then you did you do an eligibility practice to see if there is a disability. Screening is important and, and we're very supportive of that, but lining up the language so that it, we are screening the for reading difficulties or areas of reading difficulties and looking to see how um, students are struggling based on characteristics associated with dyslexia, but is not about dyslexia identification. So if the special educators felt strongly about that. I, I, this is not my area of specialty. My area of specialty is assessment curriculum, those pieces, but I certainly watch what happens when we set up a system and um, I, I can describe it. Our system of assessment is that three times a year we use a universal set of screeners. Uh, if I use uh, kindergarten, we screen for letters and sounds, we screen for phonemic awareness, we screen for phonics, we screen for oral reading fluency, uh, we do sight words, so we have a, an array, and then we do something called STAR Early Literacy. We do all of those three times a year. For what age is it? Uh, this is kindergarten. Yep. First grade, we do oral reading fluency, okay. we do STAR Reader yep. or Early Literacy. So three times a year, there's, there's a series of screeners. When a student is um, showing some area of need, we provide systems of support, which might look like Title I reading support, or it might be a reading teacher, extra instruction. We're monitoring that progress. Um, and we may, if a student is showing more struggle, do additional assessment on the okay. individual. And then at the mid-year, we're assessing again on all of those assessments. And then we do it again at the end of the year. Along the way, we're doing these systems of support. If a student is not responding to the systems of support, you do a higher layer of support, and then that is not working, then you do the special education identification process. So dyslexia, um, they may have markers that have um, listed a long list of things that were working to, to, uh, to find out if they, are they progressing successfully. And if they're not, we're providing those layers, and then, uh, they may be looking for a specific learning disability in the area of reading, which would, is where dyslexia would, would fall. So the special educators asked if we could adjust the language to reflect that we are doing a universal screening on these skills that and characteristics of dyslexia, but not dyslexia identification. Why? Because dyslexia identification is more special education and it's a particular process that they have to follow. Okay. Is this the recommended? That's the recommended. That's the recommended. That's great. I don't think there's anything too scary in there. Okay. I think it, it, you're, we're very close in describing it as the bill. It's more the language to make sure it lines up with their requirements to identify okay. uh, so, in special education. So there's no, I think of some constituents, uh, you have a, a young woman now who was screen, was not screened. Well, maybe she was screened. I'd have to talk to her parents. But the dyslexia was missed, if you will. Okay. So th is this in some way, would this person still be captured? The that? person would be captured and okay. probably um, sooner than in the past. Okay. Act 173 in Vermont yep. multi-tiered systems yep. of support are, are really one of the pieces that put those systems of screeners in place yep. and then the follow-up systems of support. Okay. I would say prior to that, some systems did and some did may not have. Um, but I guess maybe the way for me to ask it, I'm sorry to interrupt, but this might be helpful. Would this person if they were screened after this bill is passed with this language recommendation, is something not going to happen where their dyslexia would be addressed right away? Um, it sounds like a it struggle of reading would get would get addressed right away. Okay. Whether um, it's just it's the purpose of the screener is to figure out who has needs and in what area yeah. and in what layer right. of support sure. is needed. It's not to identify an area okay. of disability. And so trying to separate that language mm -hmm. uh, is what I'm bringing to the table. Okay. Yeah. 
if I can, yes. um, going back a step, given given the systems of support that you outlined, are you supporting the bill overall? I am. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. in the council. Okay, but if there's already a system of support, what does the bill bring? It's not. I'm just. You know, again, I'm not a, a professional educator. I don't have any depth in this field. Yeah. Can you help? It's a good question. And uh, a colleague asked me that question today. I was I was doing legislative updates with the Vermont curriculum leaders and asking for feedback. Um, they asked the same question. I would say one is raising awareness. Uh, the second thing is it's getting more specific and clarifying what we are looking for. So what, uh, even though we have state standards that say phonemic awareness and phonics, and we have requirements that say we have to screen and do follow-up assessment. It does not say specifically what we need to screen on, and it uh, it may not be as specific as the list that's in the bill. I, I think you raised the key point that I'm uh, also making is it's really important to line things up because we have a number of requirements already in place that are represented. And so uh, the council is saying we agree wholeheartedly with efforts to improve literacy outcomes and provide supports for students as quickly as possible. If this bill helps us get there, that's a good thing. But avoiding redundancies, a way to avoid redundancies is to at least line up the language and help us um, where, and then include those pieces that you're working to clarify, like what are you screening, what are the areas that we are screening for? Um, and how do we preserve special education in particular because that's federal law. That's your area more than mine. Thank you. Okay. For sure. Yes, yeah, not sure. Please. So do you, you probably can't comment or don't want to comment or maybe both on schools that don't use MTSS, do you, at this time? Well, we're all required to. So oh. we, I mean, it's our, it's our statute. MTSS. Multi-tier oh, systems right. of support. Thank you. And I'm going to mix up whether it's statute 2902 or 2903, but it's already in statute and requirement. It's in our federal law. Uh, when we receive federal funds, we're required to have multi-tiered systems of support. And when you say uh, in a, uh, public schools, schools receiving public funds. Uh, okay, because you, in your language and in the original language, it's approved independent schools as well. Um, I did not. That that actually comes from the the craft of the bill. I didn't. Okay. Um, I, I think that's a decision point on your end. Right. That's um, why I was asked. But you you don't can't comment. And don't want to comment on what to do with schools that don't have MTS. I would I would say um, for the public schools. Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, we have a requirement to follow yeah. based on a series of state and and some federal language that requires multi-tiered system support. Mm -hmm. Act 173 slightly redefined that or strengthened multi-tiered systems of support. And then there was a field guide that is part of uh, the agency's uh, guidelines on how to do that. And schools are implementing this. They may be earlier in implementation, they may be just setting up their screenings. They must might just be setting up their systems of support. Staffing has been a challenge, so not every school has enough staff uh, or to to uh, they have more positions available that are not fully filled. Um, so th they may not be fully operational, but it is one of our requirements, and we are all working really hard on. Yeah, it was passed. I want to say one seventy three. Two sessions ago. Yes. And uh and then there was a slight so you're delay saying that's still kind changing. of getting up and going. Um, so staffing issues. Well it, yeah. there were two parts with it. You know, there was the funding part, yep. there was the special education identification mm -hmm. and rule changes, mm -hmm. and then there was the part which is about curriculum yeah, so assessment. So there yeah. are okay. a lot of systems mm -hmm. that it impacts. Yeah. Thank you for that answer. I really appreciate it. I just think at some point, because we're going to have a decision point in our committee as to whether this should be more broadly uh, rolled out with independent or approved independent schools as well. Do you have a feeling? Do you have a well? Opinion? We do share public dollars with our with independent approved independent schools and. I think if we're required as public schools, it's very nice if we're sharing the dollars if we share the requirements. 
So, uh, I, uh, when we receive Title One dollars, so when we receive extra funds, we do have requirements to share those funds. Uh, so my personal opinion would be that it, it'd be nice if they're uh, they're sharing them. We've not had that conversation with Bit Club. Um, the council does have independent schools, the Vermont oh, curriculum leaders, I'm you. sorry. Uh, the advisory council does include the independent schools. There is a representative uh, from the independent schools and there are three community members. And, and I think they are both representing public and independent schools, the community members. Do you think you might be able to send us the name <laughs> of the person on the advisory committee? <laughs> Sure. It's Susan, it's, uh, um, Susan Gray okay. is the representative. And oh, that's the representative of the... The advisory council for the independent schools, okay. the Vermont independent schools. She's very supportive of uh, the uh, multi-tier systems of support, um, of uh, screening, of structure of literacy. She, uh, she's very supportive of this. Yeah, it's great. It's just how do you how do you thread it because they don't necessarily follow the same guidelines. Do you know what I mean? It all follows yeah. the same rules. Yeah. So how, I, yeah, I can't. I, I can't know, make I that, know. but I I do love it when I'm working from the same playbook. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Great. Yeah. So curiosity question. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go down a rabbit hole, but uh, we're right. home. Driver. <laughs> well, there are rat holes too. <laughs> uh, homeschooling. How do we catch kids that may not be, may need intervention? Okay. Is, that, is there any system? Um, well, homeschool has to go through an approved system. So when I, if I'm a parent or a caregiver and opting to homeschool, I have to have an approved plan with the state. And so I fill out my application and I have to demonstrate how I'm going to meet that curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, by having resources on the Agency of Education website, um, including professional learning, including resources about assessment, they would have access to that. But I can't say what the, what the approval process or how they might um, access uh, homeschool families do have the ability to work with public schools to come in and access parts of public schools that can be part of the approval plan. Um, we have had students sometimes who participate for academics, sometimes for athletics, different parts of school. But in particular, literacy and whether the child is where they should be in this particular aspect, reading. Um, well, I would say that the having resources at the Agency of Education published available for anyone would probably best be those there. Um, but there's no check. There's no, that's what we're looking at. Is there something that we look at reading number, you know, stats all the time. Yeah. We want to. There's nothing that captures these kids. I, I, I don't know what the process for application. You yeah, can make it do that in that. I don't know if they have a data collection at all. Uh, just to that point, um, I'm quite certain that that's what, one of the things that we changed last year is yeah. there is no assessment or no, in terms of no reporting required. Yeah, right. Yeah. I'm just it's still it's wondering if there was like a standardized year. test piece in there, but that could be gone after that was saying no. Senator Williams. Oh, yes. Back to this. Um, okay. Yes. If you don't mind, so we can. Yes. My, the other recommendation that I made was there was a little bit of confusion about the grade levels for the bill. Okay. So my second recommendation is to clarify, I believe this is a K-3 literacy bill and in initiative. There is a section where you had K-3, to there's another section that said screening for dyslexia characteristics in grade K-1. to So I didn't know, and I also wondered if wherever you land on that clarification, if you would put that in the description of the, the bill um, so that um, a high school literacy teacher is not thinking this is part of their screening process or the, I, it would help clarify where this uh, lands in school and stuff. The St. James, you see that in there, there's the discrepancy exists? Um, I'm not sure. I would call it a discrepancy. Okay. It would be the policy choice. 
um, because the language is specific to um, universal reading screeners for grades three, uh, K through three, and then um, dyslexia screening for dyslexia characteristics was specific to kindergarten or first grade. So I think that you all should take testimony on whether that's an appropriate distinction to make. And you're saying, Ms. Carmoli, you think I might say make those agree. Um, make those agree. Make those agree. Okay. I, I think. Um, what's, what's the some, harm in going K through three with everyone? Some of the things that you're looking for in second and third grade are really specific to kindergarten and first grade skills. So phonemic awareness is one, the letters and sounds and how um, oral reading fluency you can do in any grade. Comprehension you can do in any grade. But the early reading, identifying letters and the sounds of letters are specific to kindergarten and first grade. So I would, my recommendation would be clar clarify which grade levels you're interested in. I think we're going to go K through three. Okay. Unless there's major objection at this point, we'll see a new draft that will look at K through three. Okay. And then I would put that into the title or the description sure. of it, which is the bill for sure. kindergarten through third grade. Sure. Being Anything else? Just a huge thank you. Uh, I did include the advisory council recommendations that we've made. Uh, I brought those back. Uh, and um, I have been really heartened by all of the uh, collaboration and uh, consistency that I'm hearing as I talk to Vermont Superintendent Association, Vermont Principals Association, the Vermont School Board Association, uh, Vermont Curriculum Leaders, the, the Vermont uh, Council of Special Education uh, Administrators. People are really interested in working and are working very hard on this. They're appreciative for the efforts and anything you can do to align language and requirements will help the work that is happening and it's going to make it better for students. So these advisory council recommendations aren't related to 204. No, they're not. Right. They're okay. Just okay. Yeah, in general. Just bringing it back to see yeah. sure. Which which some of them, I mean, I looking at the, I know the first one, we had some well, we can take a look at it as it relates to our okay. new work, but I'm glad you brought them back. Great. Ms. St. James, any clarity that you need from us? So we're gonna move forward with these recommendations as presented and we'll look at a new draft uh, in the coming days, and then we have some decision points to make, and we'll return to 303, and hopefully by the end of next week, we'll be able to start to put possible vote markup, because this will go down to appropriations, where it will sit. Um, and yeah, but we'll have to make nice with the appropriations. Okay. Yeah. It was really fun to hear the um, 303, the Delhi Parton Imagination Library. They came to the council. I uh, did a brief presentation, um, and they've been uh, sending some updates. So like, there is also a lot of positive energy. About yeah, that, so. yeah. You have to figure out the fiscal side. I know. The fiscal you know, That's I, the. There's a one hundred thousand dollar appropriation. I didn't want to get into it there, but I, I'm not sure where that came from. That was a sort of a, hey, we'll put a hundred thousand dollars in, or if that was a joint fiscal number. But we'll figure. I don't know that. Yeah. Well. If you did, I would be very impressed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, I think we're finished for the day. Uh, thanks, everybody.